I don't know how much 15 seconds is. No to chyba, chyba już minęło 15 sekund. E, dzień dobry Państwu, ja się nazywam Agazano. E, dzisiaj naszymi gościniami na tym panelu, który, który właśnie zaczynamy, będą trzy wspaniałe pisarki, z, e, które pracowały przy i pisały opowiadania dla zbioru Niepoprawna mnogość, zbiór opowiadań wydany przez wydawnictwo Pauza w tym roku. E, świetna pozycja dla miłośników literatury irlandzkiej w której Lucy Caldwell, która edytowała ten zbiór, była jego redaktorką, wybrała dużo współczesnych twórców, twórczeń literatury irlandzkiej, współczesnej, najnowszej, o której będziemy dzisiaj rozmawiać. Więc reszta, reszta rozmowy będzie prowadzona w języku angielskim, na które się teraz przerzucę, więc witam nasze gościnie. I would like to welcome our lovely guests, uh, who will be talking about today, about their latest show story collection, um, in Polish called Niepoprawna Mnogość. Um, so our guests are Lucy Caldwell, who was an editor of this, um, of this um, collection, a writer, playwright, short story writer, um, will be published in Poland for the first time next year, translated by yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> John Carson, uh, also writer, novelist, um, uh, she wrote one short story for um, our collection, the, the short story called Pillars, um, in Polish, Filary. Uh, and Jan Gay, uh, who is also a lit an artist, a writer, novelist, she wrote, she's a very prolific writer, mostly writing in Chinese, but since recently also in English. She wrote the first story from our um, collection uh, called Jak zakochałam się w dobrze udokumentowanym życiu Aleksandra Wilana. Uh, <laughs> I will give the story in, in Polish. So the English title was How I Fell in Love in the Well-Documented Life of Alexander Whelan. Um, so, ladies, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And the first question I would like to ask you is quite predictable, seeing that this is a short story festival we are uh, we are at so let's talk a little bit about short fiction because all of you are also authors of novels of plays of bigger larger sort of more substantial genres <clears throat> um so i was wondering how did you feel about writing short stories what is it about short stories that a novel or a play or a large genre fiction cannot give us and is it more difficult to write short stories. So Lucy, as you are like a godmother of this <laughs> book, maybe you'd, like to, maybe you'd like to start. Yeah, I came across a definition recently by the Irish writer Sean O'Fuelon of the difference between a short story and a novel. And we get lots of these, you know, Laurie Moore says a short story is an affair to the novel's marriage. Um, Chekhov calls a short story a shot of vodka. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have all these sort of comparisons. And this is one that I loved where Sean O'Foylon said, a novel is like a jumbo jet. It can carry a lot of people a vast amount of distance, but it sort of lumbers along for a while before it can get up in the air. Mm -hmm. And he said, compared to that, the short story is like a hot air balloon. It can mm -hmm. reach um, almost celestial heights, but it can only take a couple of people. Um, and I love, I love that sense of, for me, the short story is the most magical, tricksy, elusive mm. of forms. Um, my first short stories, I wrote my first collection, yeah. um, just after I'd written my first novel. And I wrote my first novel thinking I was writing a short story. I was still an undergrad. And I just started writing and the story kept going, going, going. And I realized it was a novel. Um, I finished it on my creative writing masters and, and got a publishing deal. And I had this vision for this collection of short stories that I wanted to write. And they were all going to be set in Belfast or between Belfast and London. They were all going to be narrated by girls or young women. I sort of had this vision of it in my head. And I thought, well, how hard can it be? You know, I've written a novel. Uh, so I started writing these stories and they were awful. None of the stories worked individually, and somehow the whole collection was even less than the sum of its parts. And that was my first inkling of, you know, I'd written the novel so naively. A novel is far more forgiving as a form. 
the short mm. story, there's nowhere to hide. You know, yeah. Kevin Barry describes it as pull tight like a tightrope. You know, the second it goes slack, you're lost, it's gone. And so those stories, it took me, um, that, that collection was published 11 years after I first began it. And I think there are three stories in my first collection, Multitudes, that took, a le- I just couldn't quite let go of the idea for them. And I would come back to it, you know, maybe every six months or every couple of years to see if I had enough technique to make it work. Mm. And I didn't, and I didn't, and I didn't. And then I started to. <clears throat> and I think it was having written, you know, three novels, a novella, stage plays, radio drama, that gave me enough of the technique to do what I wanted with the short story. So I think, yeah, the short story, I love the short story form. It's magical, but I think it's very, very hard, very hard to write a good one. Which is quite incredible because when I was working on your short stories and reading them, they seemed so effortless and, you know, so light. So to hear that you had to give yourself 10 years of sort of dipping your finger, you, you know, your to- toes in and, and leaving and trying and, and leaving just to sort of... Yeah, I'm so interested to hear, especially from a translation perspective, because one of the stories, the challenge was really, really technical. It was a story that's written in the second person. Mm -hmm. which is you, you know, you do this, you do that. And also it's written in the future tense Mm -hmm. and then it slips into the future perfect tense. Mm -hmm. And one of my problems was I wanted this story to have this sort of euphoric rush towards the end, the sense of everything kind of like taking off. But in English with the future perfect tense, there are too many syllables in every line. You know, you will have done this, you will have done that. And so it was just so technically hard to get the rhythms right, that they just feel sprung. You know, the reader doesn't notice them. They're not stumbling mm-hmm. blocks in the way. So there were sort of tonal difficulties, technical difficulties, tense difficulties, all these all these things. And then, like you said, in a short novel, there's nowhere to hide with it. So, Yen, what yeah. is your experience with with short stories? How how did it, you know, differ from, for you from, from writing, you know, big, big novels? And was it more difficult for you? Mm, maybe yeah, not. definitely. Um, no, it was so difficult. I, I was just really fascinated by what Lucy was describing, like her process of working on her short stories. And I really like when she was talking about her collection, I remember me reading her collection and like what she was saying, Aga, it's like so natural. And then the tone setting was like immediate. You open the page and you're just like immediately <clears throat> taken into this world. and. And, and yeah, I I always thought she was a natural. <laughs> and it's, I don't know if it's like, um, if it's, you know, in some ways, like a relief to hear that she also <laughs> struggled. <laughs> and, and I think I definitely struggle. And I'm, I'm so like, um, first when I was writing in Chinese, and I've been writing in Chinese for many years. And um, I began to write when I was very young. I think similarly to Lucy and... So I think my natural literary form would be novels. Um, mm-hmm. So I like, of course, I wrote short story collections in Chinese, but I think novels seems to be the the, the form that I really settle in. Um, because I have this feeling that novel, like what Lucy was saying, is very forgiving. So it really mm-hmm. is like it's very kind to me. You know, you can be. I always feel like I'm a bit slow when it comes to writing, and I think novel just novel like as a form like writing it just gives me the time to kind of adjust mm-hmm. myself whereas short mm-hmm. story yeah i think i pretty much started writing short story when i started to write in english so in a way those two things happen simultaneously and it was really kind of um you know it's it's like it's such a i i don't really know what would be the right word it definitely was like a violent experience in a sense <clears throat> and not in a bad sense but it's just, it's so like fierce. And mm-hmm. and in a way I have to redefine myself um, in this language and then writing short story. Uh, I really don't think I'm a good short story writer to be honest, every time when I'm asked <laughs> to do that, I'm like, I really don't have anything to say because I, I feel I'm really learning. I would never read other people's short stories. And I was like, oh, this is great. And then I wrote, I read my own stories. So I was like, <laughs> I think I'm really struggling to be honest and I don't even know if it's because of the, the switch of language or the switch I don't know like which one is more dramatic um in my experience it's like switching from writing novels to writing short stories or switching from writing in Chinese to writing in English mm-hmm. and my feeling is 
I think short story is full of rejections. Um, it does, it's it because it's it's so tight and it and you know like like I think novel in a way it embraces you. It's sort of a you can really kind of enjoy like reading a novel. That sense mm-hmm. of like relaxation, and you don't get that uh, with short stories. I think I you do get, get the sense of yeah. You don't get to feel being comfortable, and I think both as a writer, like when you write short story, you have mm-hmm. this sense of being rejected by the story all the time. It mm-hmm. it just tries to run away from you, or like it doesn't reveal to you what it is. Whereas with novel, you know, often you work on it for a rather long time, so it became really like your partner. It feels very kind of moved in and comfortable to be working on this project. You never get, I never get that anyway with a short story. And I think similarly to read a short story is that sense of like, it's like this, this sense of like quite edgy, because like, it constantly like rejects you or challenges you, um, mm-hmm. which you, you get from novel, but not all the time. So it's yeah. kind of definitely a much more heightened experience um, in both writing and reading. Yeah. Mm. So Jan, Jan, you you are now um, about to promote um, one of your novels. So you are sort of, I imagine, sort of born a novel mindset right now. But is there anything you'd like to add to to what the girl said? Like, what's your experience with? What's your relationship with short stories? Well, actually, in, in English, I'm promoting a short story collection at the minute, oh, right. the, the Last Resort, which is um, just out a few months ago, but I'm promoting translations of my last novel, so I feel like mm-hmm. two heads, both the novel head and the short story head on, and mm-hmm. really love what Yen just say about, said about the short story form really making you work, and like, I kind of feel yeah. like you were talking about it, Yen, it almost sounded like a kind of like troublesome toddler kind of thing that you have to <laughs> wrestle with and reel into submission. Um, I don't have mm-hmm. any toddlers myself, but I do know a few. Um, and I guess that's the same. I, I would probably naturally fall to the novel as a form as well because of that thing that both Lucy and Yen have talked about, the idea of breathing space. And also journeying with your characters. I'm a, definitely a character-driven writer, as I, I know Lucy is very much as well. And with mm-hmm. a novel, it feels like you're you're developing a friendship over a long period of time with your characters. And um, What I do love about the short story is that it, it has this opportunity, for me anyway, to be a little bit more experimental. And mm. I am a magical realist, um, mostly, and I definitely pillars in this collection is a magical yeah. realist story. Um, and it's sometimes quite hard to sustain those fantastical elements over a full novel. Um, I've just finished reading Yen's Fantastic Strange Bases of China, and she, she does the mad stuff for a very long time very <laughs> well, but I can only do little snippets of it. And I feel the short story allows me to do that. Um, I do reject a lot of short stories. So I've, I've heard Kevin Barry talk about this and it really reassured me. Um, you know, I would maybe write four short stories and just chuck them in the bin to get to one that I think there's something there to, to work at. Thankfully, I wouldn't be writing four novels before I, I get to a novel that I want to keep working at. And I think the, the other thing that I always want to say about the short story form, and um, I think Jen and Lucy have probably heard this before from me, is there's something really particular about being an Irish short story writer. There's such a rich tradition in this part of the world for the short story form. And it's almost like, you know, as, as a writer, when you approach a publisher with a short story collection, they'll always say, you know, oh, it's good, but have you got a novel in you? <gasps> like, you know, the novel's the pinnacle. Mm-hmm. In Ireland, it's almost the other way around. It's kind mm-hmm. of like, what, you can't write short stories? What's wrong with you? Are you, you, you know, you're not a proper writer <sighs> until you've nailed the short story mm-hmm. form. And that, that can be both desperately intimidating and mm-hmm. also a really good kind of motivation. Um, there is nothing as wonderful in the world as being in a community with other writers like these lot who are so good at the form and challenging it and doing new innovative things. It pushes the rest of us on to keep trying. Um, and it's a, it's a really healthy community as well that, mm. that both encourages but also nurtures. So um, is, I would say Ireland is probably the best place in the world to be a short story writer at the minute, as you can see from the, you know, you've oh, dipped yeah. into the collection, you can see that. Oh, yeah, well, it's, it is a very strong collection indeed, yeah. Lucy? 
Uh, yeah, it's so interesting thinking of, I've just recently finished my the first novel that I've written, my fourth mm. novel, but the first that I've written in maybe 10 years. And in that time I've written, I've published two collections of short stories, edited an anthology of short stories, and I'm halfway through a new short story collection. And what I realized coming back to the novel form is that what you have as a novelist is you have time. Um, you know, the novel is the great medium of time. Things can unfold. As Jan says, the way you talk about character, Jan, you know, you have, you can show that transformation. You can show the passage of time. Um, not that short story, I don't subscribe to the view necessarily that the short story is just, you know, a glimpse or a shard or a fragment. Because mm. I think you look at some short stories like um, Alice Munro, you know, you look at like the bear went over the mountain or you look at a Chekhov short story and they pack in so much, you know, they, mm. a whole life. And But yet there's mm. something, and I think it's to do with pitch, that a short story you cannot write a novel at the pitch of a short story. You know, there's something heightened. There's something more akin to poetry or more akin to a play. And if you wrote a novel at the at the pitch of a short story, it just won't work. You know, a novel needs to a novel needs to be a novel needs to be slower. A novel needs to be more modulated. All the things that would make a short story feel baggy. A novel needs that, I think. And I think um, that a short story things. You know, as Jan said, you can, it's far easier to have a short story in the second person or in the future tense or with magic realist elements. And in a novel, it's much harder for a short story or in a novel, a novel needs to, a novel can't be on the fence. <laughs> you know, in yeah. a short story, like in a play, something can be both things at once. It can be yeah. ghost and memory and neither, you know, if you see what I mean. But in a in a novel, it feels that your choices need to be more earthbound, I think. Yeah, that's uh, that's very, very beautifully put. And that's sort of something that I was thinking about it too. And we've touched on a lot of other topics that um, I would like to discuss with you today. So since that was the last thing that we spoke of, uh, I was just thinking um, in your introduction, Lucy, you wrote that Ireland is now um, going through like the golden age of literature and golden age of writing, which is a bold claim coming from, you know, the nation uh, that gave birth, you know, Joyce and Yeats and so on. Uh, but I can, I can agree with that. But I would like to, I would like to hear you say a bit more about that because, you know, what's so different from, um, how we, sorry, just a second. Jan, would it be possible for you to switch up the mic? Thank I was you. just thinking about yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> so what I was thinking is, um, what do you think is different in today's Irish literature from how it was for the previous generation? Because in the book, you in, in, the, in the short story collection, you chose this um, timeline, time frame of um, people who debuted after 1998, so the Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Agreement, and that is like a milestone in, you know, the history of Ireland and Northern Ireland and, the, you know, the whole, um, the whole island as such. Yeah. And I was wondering how do you see that change in literature? How do you see what has changed from this, you know, previous generation to what we have in Irish and Last question. Um, I think um, you know it was being it was being said that this was a golden age of Irish writing before I was editing the collection. But when I sat down to edit the collection, um, I really realised you know I could have I could have edited this collection three times over with a completely different array of writers. Mm -hmm. You know there were such riches to choose from. Um, I the the decision that I made to start post Good Friday Agreement yeah. um, is one, it was an I thought it was an instinctive decision. You know, I thought through it a lot, but when um, I'd had these collections, this is the sixth in the series of mm -hmm. um, the Faber, um, you know, new Irish short stories. And the first four were edited by legendary editor, David Marcus. And he had the idea that to make an anthology exciting, you need to have a mix of um, established and celebrated writers.
pictures and brand new voices. Mm-hmm. And he thought it's the energy that comes from that, that that makes the collection interesting. And then after he died, um, Faber kept on the series. They had one edited, they three more, one edited by Joseph O'Connor, one edited by Kevin Barry, one edited by Deidre Madden. And um, they happened to be edited by my editor at Faber. Mm-hmm. And we had a conversation where he said, the new version there has been one published every sort of two or three years in in the the, the history of its life um, but he said he didn't really know if there was room if there was space for it anymore because it used to be one of the only places that you would find a collection of Irish writing um, but since then there are so many you know there's stinging fly and there are so many little magazines I say little they punch far above their weight but new magazines by small presses like mm. Banshee like Tangerine um, you know Granta does its new Irish short stories and so he said um if I was to edit it would I have a vision for it and um I thought about it and I realized so quickly that I very much did and what I would have done um you grow up I've got the postcard here um when I published my first book deal my sisters made me um, a card, a congratulations card you can see I don't know if it's mirror image in your screen but it's the famous um picture of Ireland's writers and you get this. I was at a festival just before lockdown um, in a big Irish city and you still get this postcard sold. Although there have been, people have done corrective since. But, you know, it's like Joyce and Sing and Swift and Wild, And they found a sort of picture of me with a kind of severe fringe and, and thick glasses and no makeup. And they tip X my name on just kind of below Patrick Kavanagh's shoulder. <laughs> um, and I'd had this on my notice board and always thought it was such a joke. But then you start thinking, OK, well, where is Edna Bryan? You know, where is Mary Lavin? Where is Anne Enright? Where is where are all these writers that were missing? And um, Sinead Gleeson had done a wonderful, wonderful thing a couple of years before I edited Being Various, which was she had an anthology um, called The Long Gaze Back, which was 400 years of Irish women writers. And in the promotion and the celebration for that, there was a panel of us northern writers who said where's our anthology like what because women have long been left off any sense of an irish writing canon oh yeah and yeah. and and also if, you, if you're a woman writer you're aware of that if you're a northern writer as jan will know so often there are lists of irish writers and they don't have a single northern writer on them um so if you're writing and you're and, it, and it's more complicated coming from the north of ireland northern ireland mm-hmm. you know ulster because identity is more conflicted um growing up certainly i now i hold both passports irish and mm-hmm. british um but i i only had a uk passport and i wouldn't have felt that it was my right to call myself irish growing up even though i was from the island of ireland and and the good friday agreement is the thing that changed everything for my generation you know it sort of it made plurality possible the title of this anthology in english is being various and that comes from the lines from a louis mcneese poem that i think should be the sort of anthem of northern ireland it comes from a beautiful poem called snow and the closing lines are i peel and portion a tangerine and spit the pips and feel the drunkenness of things being various and the poem it's a sort of semi-mystical poem and it's a a metaphysical poem and it's about the possibility of being both and rather than either or and so I wanted I chose a Good Friday Agreement because for my generation for Jan for so many writers that I know that was a thing that allowed you to be um, an Irish writer um, have an Irish passport and a British passport to be Irish in a more multiplicitous more complex way um, bef- when I chose the date of the Good Friday Agreement as my cutoff, this was before Brexit. This was mm. before the Good Friday Agreement was endangered. You know, it was a kind of prescient decision, as it turns out. But I made that decision. And then the other thing that I wanted to do was, in for so much of Ireland's history, it's been a history of emigration. And one of the things that's been most striking in my generation is um, the level of immigration to Ireland. You know, people choosing to come here, coming here from from elsewhere. And I know there are stories that just aren't told. Um, a writer that I mentor as Muslim came to Belfast, outside of Belfast, as a two-year-old. Um, and, you know, where is she in the canon? My son has a little friend at school whose grandmother came from what was then called British Guiana, who moved to Northern Ireland in the 1950s. You know, where is her story? So yeah. I wanted to have stories of people who had come to Ireland from elsewhere 
um, stories of people who were born outside of Ireland to one Irish parent, one non-Irish parent. You know, I wanted to sort of break open, kind of provocatively break open what it means to be an Irish writer. Um, so, so that's a very long and baggy no, answer, not. but but there is so much, you know, identity, it's such a complex thing and there were so many things to, you know, weave in and so many balances to get in the writer that I wanted to represent some of the exciting things, you know, formally, creatively, yes, yeah, some of the places that the, the writing is... Oh, yeah, is, no, is it's, it's a gorgeous answer. Thank you so much for putting so much you know, in it, because you really, really delivered in, in, you know, all the aspects of what I was, you know, wondering. And one of the things you said, which I loved, was about that after the Good Friday Agreement and, and nowadays Ireland, instead of being this or that, you can be this and that. And you have this beautiful, you know, from my times living in Northern Ireland, I think the word I used to hear most often, apart from the peace process, <laughs> was uh, was diversity and diversity was like the word I heard everywhere and all the time and it sort of felt like the nation itself especially Northern Irish nation was sort of grappling and sort of you know trying to come to terms with the idea of diversity and of being various because as you said Irish and Northern Irish people have a long tradition and history of emigrating of leaving Ireland leaving Northern Ireland to either Britain or to the US or to other places and being displaced in a way culturally, you know, with a heritage. But now the trend is sort of other way around and people are sort of more coming to Northern Ireland, to Ireland and finding their place within this culture and sort of looking for this sense of Irishness. And here we can segue very well to our next question, which is, um, I would like to start with Yen this time uh, because I was wondering about what Lucy was saying about two things. First of all, the sense of Irishness and um, where do you see yourself being in, being in Ireland and writing about Ireland or writing, you know, sort of being in the collection of, you know, Irish writers and where do you see your Irishness in, in writing coming? How do you see it sort of comes into, into your writing? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that was the first thing that came up. I could have done it when I was muted. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. And it's, an, well, like, um, like what I was just saying, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I'm a, a real short story writer when it comes to, like, short fiction. I always feel like I'm a fake. I think maybe this is kind of like a similar case when people ask me about my Irishness. I'm like, really? Um, I feel like I'm a fake. Um, but in a way, I think, well, I think when Lucy uh, wrote me the email asking me to write a story, whether it would be possible to, to write a story for um, this anthology, um, it was my son's first vaccination day, and I was at the GP, and he was, and my husband was there, he was crying his heart out, and because he had just gotten a shot, and I got this email, and I just couldn't believe that, and and. I think the story I wrote for this anthology, um, this story with this embarrassingly long name, and was really the only thing I did um, the first year since, you know, the first year, during the first year of my son's life when I was being like this miserable mm -hmm. new mom living in Dublin. Um, and in a way, I feel, well, obviously there's nothing about like being a mom in that story per se, but I feel it really... It's a reflection, I think, of my psyche at that particular point where I really kind of struggle as a person. Like my physical being in Dublin is just like extremely incompatible. Mm -hmm. um, but this very sense of like, you know, like I was saying, like short story is in a way like a constantly being rejected. And I kind of feel maybe my experience of living in Dublin that particular year as a new mom, I think I'm being rejected. Um, as like you know you couldn't really settle in i think it's a lot of things not not just about me being chinese it's about like me being chinese and also me becoming a mom for the first time mm. and, and and then that, and that's and um, i always feel this was such a significant thing to me that i got that email and i was invited to participate in this anthology where it seems you were given an access to say you can express yourself and whatever feeling you're you have and and then I wrote that story and 
So I think if you have to ask me to say that, like, so I recently actually shamefully as a fake in the short fiction world, I recently finished the short story collection and, and, Shame, and shamefully. Coming, <laughs> and it's coming out in like this is like my niche debut sort of a um so I have nine stories in that collection and I think four of them took place in Dublin in Ireland and so and three of them took place in China and there were two took place in like some other places so yeah. I think that the composition of that the of the nine stories pretty much speaks for like how like, you know, like my being as an English writer I think indeed that I just feel I constantly feel like a fake kind of being in this quote and being in the Irish literary circle and being so generously accepted and having this community and um, but recently so this is again sorry I'm just not making much sense I went to visit a friend who's also a Chinese woman who's married to an English husband. And, and so we were chatting and then she was constantly interrupted by her husband. Maybe she asked him to do so. I didn't know. She didn't seem to be like offended or anything. This seems just to be a thing. And her husband was correcting her English all the time. And it's not like she made a grammatic mistake. It's just maybe a pronunciation. He'd stop her in the middle of the conversation and to tell her how to say it. And she said it again. And later when I was talking to this woman who was like a literary person and a documentary director and she was like, oh, I really, I wanted to try to write in English, but I think I can't really because like, I know that my husband, uh, my husband told me that um, my English is quite broken. I, I don't really have proper English. And, and then that was the moment I realized I'm so lucky to have an Irish husband. <laughs> And I'm so lucky to be in the Irish like literary community where this very sense of fakeness is also being really generously being accepted as a way of authenticity. And mm -hmm. I think to me, that's my Irishness. It's like, I think this whole literature, like the Irish literal world or this notion of like Irish writers, like I don't really know much about it to be honest, mm -hmm. but I feel it's quite, it, it uh, it embraces and it accepts it accepts like all kinds of possibilities and it's I think you know people just well really like enjoys rebel against the norms of this language of like <laughs> so I think that just gives me the space really I think very fortunately I was in that place and got this invitation from Lucy and I think that space of allowing me to be playful, to be an outsider, to be uncertain, to be a fake, is part of my understanding of like Irish literary circle or Irish liter literature. And mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm so lucky and I just like purely randomly, it's not like I set out looking for Irish husband. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like I'm so lucky and I've like landed in this place in Dublin and in this part of the world. and. And then being sort of accepted for, you know, my, for, for being, for like, both as me and as outsider and as like a person who lives in Ireland mm -hmm. who has like serious bond with Ireland, like all of those things, I think were just mm -hmm. accepted. And, and I think that was really important to me. And in a way, if I can say that is my Irishness. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, it does make, it does make sense. It does make sense. And I was thinking, also in the same in the vein of sort of Irishness and being Irish and the collection being Irish short stories and the word Irish keeps coming up and I keep thinking of Northern Ireland. Um, I keep my, 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 my thoughts keep coming back to Northern Ireland and to so, sort of what, what Lucy said as well. It's sort of like to me it sort of links and connects in a way like meshes into like one story. Um, the story of identity in a way like uh because it's it's a story of irish writers but you did include a lot of northern irish writers which to me was an absolute delight because like you said northern irish voices are often being sort of overlooked in literature a lot and like even you know when i was thinking like when i have to list like from top of my head when i had to list some northern irish writers i would come up mostly with you know men and mostly playwrights or poets, and I would say Seamus Haney or, um, you know, Brian Friel, Kieran Carson, you know, um, 
these were the uh, sort of these were the names I would sort of think of, and I realized how few now I would also say Anna Burns, for example. Um, but there was still, I realized how few Northern Irish voices and female voices from Northern Ireland are still being heard. But um, how does it connect to you in a way? This, this is there some difference, like some fundamental difference in literature from Ireland and from Northern Ireland? Because I feel like perhaps until not so long ago, Northern Irish writing had to be political. And it sort of had to touch on, you know, the fundamental questions of identity, freedom, you know, the politics of being in Northern Ireland, you know, the sectarian bit um, and, you know, the the conflict within Northern Ireland, within Ireland in relation to Northern Ireland and in relation to Britain and sort of looking for one's own identity. Like you say, Lucy, you say that you hold both passports, but you're still not sure where you stand in this, you know, um, in this in this um, whole picture. So I was wondering, how do you view this relationship between Irish and Northern Irish literature and how do they work today? Yeah, um, Jan, do you want to go yeah. on that? Or I've... I would love to yeah, hear yeah. Jan first, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it is something, I'm, I'm probably the most overtly Northern Irish political yeah, yeah. writer of the three of us, because a, a lot of what I do, um, write, I'm writing about politics with a, a capital P in Northern Ireland a lot, and particularly the kind of unionist tradition of mm -hmm. things. Um, what I will say, Aga, is a couple of things. First of all, um, I think there always was a bedrock of strong Northern Irish writing, um, which wasn't necessarily about politics with a capital P. Yes, it did mm -hmm. touch on, on what I would call political issues, so issues around women and education and, and how, how we structure ourselves here. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it just never made it out of Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Um, because of that, that kind of assumption that when you take your work to a major publisher and you are a Northern Irish writer, they will say, and why are you not writing about the troubles? It's, it's almost like the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of us that began publishing post, um, post kind of Good Friday, that was a kind of double bind because um, the publishers were kind of done with the troubles at that point. They were like, it's all been said. Everything that needs to be written about the troubles has been said. We're not interested in, any, in it anymore. But they also were saying, if you're a Northern Irish writer, why aren't you writing about the troubles? It's, you know, the biggest subject to come out of that corner of the world. Mm -hmm. So books like Milkman and um, TV programmes like Dairy Girls have done us yeah. a tremendous service because they're showing us that there are stories about the conflict that haven't been told yet. Perspectives like the perspective of teenage girls, you know, yeah. the queer perspective, the working class perspective, the rural perspective. There's a lot more stories about the troubles that haven't been told yet. There's also a wealth of fantastic writing, which rightly says I'm not interested in writing about that I want to write about all of the other wonderful things that writers around the world are engaging with and I think that's absolutely amazing and um, you know there's a writer Susanna Dickey's Tennis Lessons mm -hmm. an amazing novel which could be set anywhere it happens she just happens to be from this neck of the world the one thing I will say and I'll, I'll shut up after this is I think we do have it a little bit harder coming from Northern Ireland in that you're expected to be able to talk politics even if you're not mm. writing about politics. So when I, you know, I, I my last novel won the EU Prize for Literature for Ireland, which allowed me to travel around Europe to lots of different places, often in the company of other Irish writers. And it was yours truly that got asked to explain Brexit and the issues with the border and the Northern Irish Protocol. There was an assumption that the other Irish writers who weren't from the North probably wouldn't be able to speak at length about those subjects. And it's the same if you're a children's book writer whose work doesn't touch on, on Northern Irish politics at all, or you're a playwright or whatever. If you're from the North, you're expected mm -hmm. to be able to carry yourself in terms of politics. I enjoy it. I love talking about those things, but not everyone does. And I think that's an unfair assumption. Um, like Lucy and I, I think, have both had the experience of having some uh, middle-aged elderly man put their hand up uh, at the Q&A section of a reading and say, can you explain the Good Friday Agreement to me? 
you know that's that's something I've been asked multiple times oh yeah I've also been asked um can you explain the um the implications of the Northern Ireland situation on the Israeli-Palestine conflict and I'm like um I just write books so yeah I, but it kind of feels when I'm when I was reading your story and it was the first story I translated from the batch that I had allocated um, in the short story collection and you write and you are a magical realist and like you said before you do that a lot but do you feel like in the light of what you just said do you feel like you have to sort of reclaim this area of writing for yourself like you had to sort of carve it out for yourself to be a magical realist and like to make a kind of a statement not to let this literature draw you in what you're expected to do as an ordinary writer um yes and no i'm i'm very lucky i think it is lucky in that i didn't come to writing via a writing program or any mm -hmm. kind of formal training i just read loads and then wrote what i wanted to write and so i didn't even know magical realism existed i just wrote the stories in the world as I see it, and then mm. discovered Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Gunter Grass and all of those writers who were using their magical realism as social political commentary, as Yen is doing extremely well in Strange Beasts. So mm -hmm. I was, you know, had my pen out going, look at that, she's amazing, it's so interesting. Um, so I just did what I wanted to do and wrote the stories I wanted to write and then suddenly realised at some point it was quite lonely. There was a moment where I was like, okay, I'm ready to discover all the other magical realists from Northern Ireland. And, you know, someone was like, there's two wee bits and a couple of Brian Murr novels and that's really about it. So I'm still, I'm still thinking, you know, why don't we have a tradition of more magical realism? I think it's catching. I mean, don't tell too many people, but Lissy Caldwell is actually writing <laughs> fantastical elements into her work now. So there could be a revival. Um, and some of it, I think, is snobbishness as well. Like sometimes the fantastic and magical elements are dismissed as genre. But some of the most powerful pieces of literature in the world have been so-called genre writing. Um, Lissy just posted me Ursula K. Le Guin and I cannot wait to dive into it next week. And that, that you know, her books change the way people see the world. So I don't think we should be dismissive of, of things that are not straight up, you know, realist literary fiction. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, and Lucy, what do you think about it? Yeah, well, I think that the writers have always been there. Um, I discovered recently um, a short story writer called Mary Beckett, and um, she had published two slim collections. One is called A Belfast Woman, the second is called A Literary Woman. And A Belfast Woman, it's um, 11 stories, very short stories, um, mm -hmm. all told from the point of view of girls and women. I couldn't believe I didn't know it when I was writing Multitudes, and then A Literary Woman is her follow-up. And you can get them for pence secondhand. They're out of print. You can get like both books for like a couple of pounds, um, delivery included. And I was reading them and she is very plain, very direct. And then suddenly the stories will open up vertiginously like Chekhov um, when she's describing a character's unhappiness or even more when she's describing a character's happiness somehow even worse. And I think, you know, where, why... Why have I? Why has it been all these years of my writing life before I've re read Mary Beckett? And where are the other, where are the other writers like her who are allowed to fall into obscurity, or people don't read them, or people they're not promoted? You know, they're not seen to be telling the sort of stories that should be coming um, from a particular place. I am um, in uh, about 20, 2011, I went to Erbil in northern Iraq to take some workshops for young women. One of the things I most love doing is to you know, help and encourage young women. And they were saying that they felt, I remember one woman saying, one young woman saying that she felt the pressure to write about contemporary Iraq like a stone on her chest. And she said it was just crushing her and crushing her breath. And I said to her, what do you want to write about? And she sort of looked at me and she said, well, actually, I've got this, um, and it was a sort of sci-fi epic. And if she starts describing this whole world, I mean, it was like something out of Le Guin. Um, and, and then another young woman started chiming in saying she wanted to write a comedy about a primary school teacher and her unruly pupils. And then another young woman put up her hand and said, actually, the thing she would really like to write about is the fact that 
when she was 14, she was allowed to go to a milkshake bar um, at the end of her street to meet her friend. But the day she turned 16, her father said she was no longer allowed to go and she couldn't understand how she had more freedoms as a 14 year old than she did as a 16 year old. And they started talking and, and I still sort of had like shivers up my spine thinking of it because you think all those stories not being told because people don't think they're the right stories or they don't think they're the stories that they're allowed to be telling. And, um, you know, those stories are just as important when you're thinking of present day Iraq. Um, you need to have stories that m reflect society, maybe in a very social realist way, but you also need the fantasy stories and you need the other worlds and you need people to be writing new ways of seeing into mm. being. Mm -hmm. um, with, you know, with Yen's story, I had read, you know, I had some of my heavyweights in my anthology, like I had um, Kevin Barry and I had Sally Rooney and I had Emma McBride and, and I had some of the North's best crime writers, because I think that's always underrepresented. And, and I had a story from Jan. And then I read this piece by Yen online. I think Yen, it might have even been your very first thing written in English. And there was such a spark to it. You know, it was it was unlike anything that I had read. And I kind of thought, you know, it was taking a big chance commissioning a writer that I didn't know, I didn't know any more of her work. Um, very little was translated, I think, at that point into Yen, at that point in English Yen. Um, but I commissioned her to write this story purely on instinct because I'd loved what she did in this piece. And the story that came back, I loved so much. You know, I put it as the first story in the collection because it speaks so powerfully about loneliness and displacement and exile and shame and when we're thinking about the ways in which it's a golden age of writing in Ireland I think one of the things that's happened in our generation um in 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 the Republic of Ireland there's been the um equal marriage referendum and there's been the bodily autonomy referendum and both of those were won <laughs> hugely by the power of individual stories and people telling stories. Um, people shouldn't need to tell their story. You know, maybe you shouldn't need to bury your wounds in public or, 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 or you, but, but those stories were won by people who, who refused silence and who refused shame. And I think that's something that's happening mm -hmm. as well when you look at essay collections by, you know, Sinead Gleeson and Emily Pine, people writing the female body, people writing experiences that might have been thought of as shameful, you know, people mm -hmm. writing motherhood. When I first, when I started writing my short stories, there was very little fiction about motherhood. You know, this is only like, you know, seven, eight years ago before I was pregnant. I really couldn't find much. It, Anne Enright wrote a brilliant collection of nonfiction called Making Babies. But there was very little fiction about motherhood and new motherhood. And so the more you read writers writing things like that, the more it becomes possible for you to write things like that. Um, you know, and Jan <laughs> says about magic realism, um, you know, I've been teaching a seminar on Northern Irish magic realism, um, Jan and Roisin O'Donnell and how it works and Marquez um, for a couple of years. And I'm um, partly having children myself, you know, revisiting some of the books I loved as a child, which have magical elements. Um, I find myself writing, you know, a, a, a sort of magic or a magic realist element creeping into my writing. And part of that comes from, from you know, reading pillars with students and saying, okay, so how does it work? And how, how and when do you introduce a magical realist element? Mm -hmm. And how do you deploy humor to deflect from the shock and all the, you know, you take something more technically and then you think, okay, I'm going to give that a go. And so that's the other way in which this is a really exciting time for Irish writing because you see what other people are doing and you 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 learn from them and you you have the benefit of what they've discovered mm -hmm. um and i find it so interesting that yen um yen's story was translated back into chinese not by her and um your editor yen didn't believe it was you did she it was such a different voice it was such a different energy um you know that's that's really exciting as well the 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 influences that you you observe and of course you know mine aren't just irish um but there is there is a lot happening very quickly, I think, in Irish fiction at the moment, which makes it an exciting time mm -hmm. to be writing. writing. And it's it's also what you said that it, it, it's kind of interesting what you said, um, how it's reflected with the reception of of the short story collection. Because I was, of course, I was reading a lot of reviews in Polish and and how it was received, and not only um, the stories by Yen and Jan are continuously coming up as the favorites the reader favorites and i'm not just saying it 
Um, <laughs> it's actually true. Like you, you both are like on the top of the favorites. But also what's interesting is a lot of people said, these stories don't feel very Irish. Like not, not yours, but the collection as such. It feels like it could have happened everywhere, anywhere. It, it, it doesn't feel like it has to be, it, it doesn't have to be set in Ireland. And I think that's sort of showing, you know, the progress that's that's actually sort of the, the development and growth that's actually being made within Irish literature, which is exactly what you what you two just just said about that. Um, but Can I also I, say, yeah. like, I think 1998 is a significant date that Lucy picked, not just in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, but, mm-hmm. but also because 1998 and afterwards is the advent of the internet. And also Mm -hmm. a huge thing in the North, the advent of cheap flights to other places. And so for a long time, there weren't that many influences, particularly coming into the North or opportunities for kind of other artists and things to come and disrupt the the echo chamber of our own thoughts. I think Mm -hmm. post 98, you have a lot more mixing and muddling of people traveling on city breaks and people finding out about other forms of writing and things on the internet. And I think there's part, those two dates almost kind of, they they run parallel. It's not just the advent of, you know, a a more peaceful Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. It's the advent of other influences starting to come in and shake things up a bit as well. A little bit like a bubble kind of bursting yeah. and sort of letting things in and out and sort of letting it breathe. You know, like the, the history of the short story in Ireland before that is a lot of, I, I have a, a word for it, I call it sad potato fiction. And um, there's a, a lot of kind of. Sorry, I couldn't be laughing. I shouldn't be laughing at that. <laughs> well, you know, if when I say the phrase sad potato fiction, you know exactly what kind yeah. of Irish literature like, I'm talking mm, about. Yeah. And 1998, it kind of burst the bubble on sad potato fiction. Mm-hmm. There's a wee bit of it still rocking about, and but there's a lot of other different forms as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, from what you said, Lu- Lucy, from what Lucy said about Yen's um, short story, I would like to sort of follow up on that because um, Lucy said about your novel that when it was sent translated back to um, to a Chinese publisher, they said that it feels like it's a different voice and it's a different kind of. A different writer they didn't couldn't believe it was yours and i think uh you already know what i'm going to ask you how does it feel to be writing in two languages and do you feel that when you write in english does it sort of hold you back or does it open up new possibilities for you how does it feel to be writing in this other language do you, do you feel it's mm. different for you yeah definitely obviously like the answer is um yes and um, it does feel quite different, and I think um, I think first when I began to write in English, which I really like had resisted for so long at that point because I was like sort of living in English for so long, um, but I had insisted that uh, Chinese had to be my literary language. So mm-hmm. I had insisted that I, you know, although I use English um, on a day to day basis, although I read in, in English, like etc., but like this has to be preserved for like only Chinese, mm. it's my literary world, because I think that it's just something beyond the using of the language is the changing of your identity. Um, but yeah, like I sort of like insisted until one point, and I think it was the story Lucy was mentioning to she read that um, it was um, published in the Irish Times. And um, it's like this story came to me, I wanted to write about this thing, but it could only take um, it could only happen in English. It's like every character, the thing people would say to one another, like everything, it would just be in English. And so then I I tried and then I wrote it in English. And then pretty much, I think at the early point of me writing in English, um, I select my material and I only write stories that came to me naturally, like like similarly to Alex Will in the story and being various. Um, it's a story that can only um, happen in English because it, yeah. it happens na- like geographically in Dublin. So, um, so I think, um, in that sense, at that point, I think I was extremely like, sort of blissful in like having just dis- discovered this new tool and a new identity and or maybe new voice. And I was doing a different interview with the Chinese um, reporter, and I said, "This is almost like me writing English. It's me resolving my uh, mid-age crisis as a Chinese writer." 
And it's like, you know, it's like <laughs> when you have your midage crisis, you go to, I don't know, to do a boot job or to buy your like sports car. And for me, it's like, I have to buy the right thing. And um, it's like this new thing. So it was really exciting for so long, I think, including when I was, um, when I was living in Dublin and writing this story for being various, I think that was definitely like the honeymoon phase. Mm. And in which like, of course, there were like restraints, like, you know, and started writing your second language. But, you know, that doesn't really, uh, you know, what, what is more important and dominant at that point is this ecstasy of like discovering this new thing. Um, but then very quickly, I think then, like when I came to England, I'm in Norwich, mainly because I came here to do a writing program. So when you were like in the pretty writing program and then you start to write in English more seriously, not in the kind of like dipping my toes in it that in that way. And I think it had definitely I was I was using this this word and during a different event, I, I think it definitely has radicalized me. In a way, I think it does make me think, you know, me writing in English is not an accident. Me speaking in English is not an accident. It's a post colonial phenomenon where people from other parts of the world and were using this language to narrate, but not the, we shouldn't be narrating the, ex, the experience the English readers expect. We should be narrating the experience that we should really, what we should do is to disrupt and interrupt both the stories and then the language itself in a way. So, so I think, and then that really got me thinking, I think in a way, and then, and then it became quite painful to write in English. <laughs> Because because I, I was thinking a lot. I was thinking about you know it's not about just to have fun. It's about it's about what what do you want to do with yourself? What do you want to do like as a writer? What is this, the significance of this like to you? And do you want to you know it's like and then you realize it's not about to write in this language. It's about you're writing towards a different readership, and this readership is tricky. It's what they call the you know the the English reader. <laughs> It's like the most vicious concept, <laughs> and and then I think it's it's to like tr having like I have to try to combat or to negotiate with this whole new thing, and and that was really really difficult, and I think I'm still struggling with it, and I really feel it was such a naive thing that at the early points of me starting to write English, and I would say, oh, I write in both Chinese and English, and and I. Do you feel like it's getting increasingly impossible that there's no, <laughs> it's it's really kind of impossible to shift um, in between two identities. It's not just a linguistic shift. And and it's it's about who you are as a writer and what stories do you tell and whose voice do you use and to which readership. And uh, But at the same time, I do feel it has made me more Political, actually, the words and uh, Jane was saying. I think literature is political. There's no way. And like what Lucy was saying, is literature amplifies the, you know, the voices from the voiceless, and that's what literature does. It makes everything personal. It it forms the narrative of the other. It makes you empathize. But mm -hmm. everything that this very sort of process. It's political. It's it, and, and and I think inevitably me writing in English has made me more political. Um, and I don't really know if it's a good thing or bad thing because I think back now thinking about me only writing in Chinese at that point, I feel it was such a nice and relaxing and innocent time <laughs> where I just where you're like a monolingual speaker. You're you're writing towards your people. And whatever problem, issues, conflicts you have is within you know, your house. It's like having a fight with your parents. And now it's really different. And I'm in somebody else's house and I'm trying to do something and mm -hmm. maybe to, you know, to try to reshape the house without uh, completely break the house down, <laughs> if that makes sense. So yeah, I think it, it is very different, but, but um, I cannot say I'm enjoying it, but I, I don't regret doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's really beautifully put. And you, you know, a lot of the things that you say also resonate with me a lot as being a having an experience as a translator, because that's what I mainly do. I translate books. So hearing that and sort of seeing this perspective on on the language from someone who writes writes bilingual fiction, bilingual work, 
is also very, very insightful. So thank you so much for, for that. And since we have time for, I think, one more question, because we have 15 minutes until we have to say goodbye, um, I would like to ask you about that, because now all of you are translated writers, um, as far as I realize. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit, how does it feel for a writer to sort of hand over your work to for it to be translated? and how does this process feel from the other side, from the side of, you know, being a translated writer, especially since, you know, obviously a lot of things that you write um, will not be trans translatable. You know, some of, some of your decisions, some of your choices, some of the words and, you know, even just, you know, the reality in which you set up your work isn't always going to be translatable. Um, and the experience that you talk about is not always going to be you know, easily, you know, transferable from one language to another, from one reader's really, you know, reader's reality to another one's. So how do you feel about that? So maybe let's start with Jan, since she's now uh, being the most recently, I think, translated. Um, yeah, so I'm in the middle of the process with mm -hmm. um, my novel, The Firestarters. Mm -hmm. It's um, been um, bought in, I think, a dozen different languages at the minute. So. We're on the fifth or sixth translation that's come out. Um, and I guess um, it's been a really flattering kind of process. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not desperately precious about my work. I really love it when, when I get to collaborate with other artists. And um, my take on a translation is that it's a new art form. It's, it's, it's different and it's unique from what I, I wrote. Um, and some of the translators I've worked with have been really hands on and we've gone through the process together and others I haven't even had a chance to meet. And you only discover after the book comes out and you begin to hear the reviews and the reader responses, you know, whether it's a good translation and how it's impacting. Mm -hmm. it, it is desperately, desperately heartening to get messages back from readers in other countries in different languages who are responding and resonating with this sweet bit of the world and the stories that I've written about it. So I think that's been the most positive thing about it. And um, the one thing that I will say, Aga, and I thought about this a lot in the last wee while, um, I have a, a novel coming out next year that's full of lots of colloquialisms and use of, of Northern Irish kind of dialects and things. Mm -hmm. And I really wrestled with my English editor to get them left in. And I, I really do not want to be the kind of writer who has in mind a kind of um, homogenous kind of translated, easily translatable version of my work. I want to write specifically and I want to write about, you know, I very much write about Northern Ireland. I know my work is very regionally specific and I think we need to stop apologising for that. Um, I think Milkman really taught me lots of lessons. and oh, yeah. is absolutely unapologetic about how she uses language in that book. And it's so beautifully done and it's so recognisably Northern Irish. And there are no points where she puts in kind of post notes, this means this, or, you know, we explain in why the, the, the conversation and the dialogue is structured the way it is. She just does it. And I had a lovely experience of being in Jaipur in India mm -hmm. and hearing from readers out there how much they love Milkman and how interested they were in Ardoin in Belfast because of that book which doesn't make any excuses for its language and I think we just need to stop doing we footnotes at the bottom like this is a, a thing that people in, in Northern Ireland say or this yeah. is a regional food other writers don't do that from around the world and for talking to translators I hope I'm not speaking on behalf of you guys but they really relish the challenge of taking Oh, slightly yeah. difficult complex pieces of language and finding ways to make it relevant so yeah I, I think we need to stop dumbing down and just write what you want to write End thank you rant. so thank you so much for saying that and yeah I can confirm that translating things like you know Northern Irish speech or you know um any kind of Belfast vernacular to me personally I let my relish in that and you know it always also takes a lot of efforts sometimes to sort of push some solutions through yeah. um, the publishing process and I have to fight for it but um, you know I do hear what you say and that's really really crucial and even though it can be hard to 
um, to translate and to show this in the other language. I think it's really, really important. So thank you for not moderating your work and thank you for not, you know, like you said, dumbing it down for, for this, you know, f for the global market or whatever. Mm. So so that's amazing. And Lucy, what would you like to, to add to it? Yeah, I sometimes think, you know, people say, who are you writing for? Yeah. And I always think I'm writing for the handful of people, you know, maybe the one or two people to whom this will make a difference. And maybe they haven't even been born yet. <laughs> you know, maybe they'll stumble across a copy of the book in 200 years time and it'll seem to speak to them. And one of the things I love is when, and I have quite a bit of it in intimacies when, you know, when I quote a poet like McNeese or Frank O'Hara or, or Plath or um, uh, Zimborska or Milosh or Keats, um, when there's that sense that time accordions away and two souls can still touch through this amazing technology that is the book that, that transports you in time, that transports you in place. It's a portal through. And so I think that that's, that's all you can know. That's all you can hope for, that your words will still speak to someone in another time through a different language. Um, yeah, they'll find their way to the people that are meant to hear them or to whom they'll they'll resonate and so I think the once once you write it yes it becomes it becomes it becomes someone else's um you know that wonderful thing about the act of reading is that you had the words on the page but the reader has to do everything you know when you write a play script it's just a blueprint until the actors yeah. bring it to life and sometimes I've seen a version of my play and it hasn't felt right I don't know why sometimes I felt I've seen one in a totally different language that I don't speak and I can tell they've got it. It just feels completely right. You know, it's a funny thing. Um, for me, it feels strangely that th th that question of, you know, voice, it felt that, like I wasn't writing in the voice that was in my head until I started writing my short stories. Mm -hmm. And partly that was technique, as I've said. I think partly also was the confidence that these stories of teenage girls and young women in sort of suburban leafy Belfast um it was partly having the confidence that I could tell those stories that those stories were worthy of telling that they were as worthy of telling as the stories that people expected to come from that place at mm. that time and so something something happened there that since it was partly politics partly confidence partly technique but something happened that I felt I started writing in my own voice then and I've only recently begun to be translated and I don't know if there's something about that, that, that confidence or that surety or something that is translatable, um, you know, when maybe, when maybe other stuff, stuff isn't. So, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I get yeah, that I, some of my translators like Jan have, have had lots of very specific questions. Others yeah. haven't had a word. I'm happy with however the person whose work it is now, mm. Um, once it needs to work. Cool. And how and how it is about about you, Jan? Because you've been translated both ways, funnily enough. So. Yeah, yeah. I was just um, well. Um, I think I think being translated, particularly into English, because um, obviously, like as a Chinese writer, I think, um, and then I do kind of work with, in particular, my English translators because I obviously don't know any other languages. And in a very kind of intimate way, and so they would sometimes send me. Well, it depends, but like you know, they could send me their first draft, and they'll add notes, and then they'll hate me, and I'll hate them for a while, and then <laughs> it gives it. I wish like, I, I wish I could say I do not relate. <laughs> but it, it is quite of a. It, it, the process itself, I think, it's quite painstaking. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and, and I, I absolutely think all the translators are just superheroes because although I do speak like, you know, two languages and theoretically, but I really cannot translate. I don't know why. And, and I feel it's like it's such a smart game and I just couldn't somehow even begin to master. So I really think they're all superheroes. And I, I feel very strange, like Jan was saying, like my um, book, uh, Strange Beast of China, which has also been translated into Polish. And so I've been receiving questions, but like that book I wrote um, 16 years ago. And um, so it's kind of very strange. I think it was via translate, translators and um, that this book now being revised in like in English and soon mm. in Polish. And, and, and I'm, I'm really, really grateful that the translators somehow like decide to spend their precious time and energy on this 
project I did many, many years ago. Maybe me, like, I think if it wasn't for the translation of, uh, like, those translations, I wouldn't really be paying this so much attention to this old work of mine. Um, but it really has brought back so much energy to me, this process. Mm -hmm. And, like, similarly, I would have, I worked with two girls who translated two of my English short stories into Chinese. Uh, I didn't like it. They didn't like it. I think it's more, it's, it's different when it's, back into your native language, <laughs> you're just like impossible. Like say my English short story collection and um, soon will, like not soon, but like now it, it will come out. And then I specifically told uh, my agent that I, I don't think I want that to be translated back into Chinese yet because it seems to be like, because it's really close and I just don't mm. think I could take it. Um, yeah, so I'm not really, I, I don't really know what's the solution for that one. Like, but, but and like the other way around, I think I'm enjoying it enormously and really like grateful to all the translators yeah. actually who's really working on that. <laughs> oh, that's that's a very interesting perspective too. And ladies, I could easily spend another two hours talking to you all because all you say is just so entertaining and fascinating. And you know, it's I'm having so much fun, and I hope as oh. our listeners. But um, we're running out of time, so all that's left for is for me to say thank you so so much for joining us today, for taking part in um, in this festival, and for finding the time to talk to us. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Aga. Thank, thank you, Milka. Thank, 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 thank you, thank you so much. So good to see all of you. It's really nice. Thanks.